Uh, thank you so much for having me here. It is so beautiful here. Um, I live in San Francisco. Um, we're also by the water, but it's nothing like it is here. It's gorgeous. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> my name is Gina. Um, as Jimmy mentioned, I am um, the designer on design systems at Salesforce. Um, I'm also an organizer of my own conference called Clarity, which is focused on design systems. And if you're familiar with SAS, the CSS preprocessor, uh, I do design work for them too. So um, if anyone attended my workshop uh, a couple days ago, uh, you'll um, recognize some of these uh, points. But um, yeah, so design systems, what are they? They're um, definitely not new. They've been around for quite a while. Um, but the way that we talk about them has changed quite a bit. So if you're thinking about design systems, you might be thinking about design guidelines or like brand uh, guidelines. Uh, these have been around for ages. Um, probably one of the most well-known ones is the one from NASA, which was done back in the 70s. Uh, it's very, very beautiful. It was done before you would typeset on the computer. Everything was done by hand. Everything was cut and pasted. Uh, this got pretty popular again with Kickstarter. There was a uh, Kickstarter campaign. Did anyone happen to buy this? Nobody? Go buy it. It's online. You can totally buy it. Um, it's really beautiful. Um, but if you don't want to buy it, NASA did put it online for free in a PDF format because it's so old that it's like public domain now. Um, but that's, you know, in book format. Um, PDF books, like those are kind of old school. My first style guide that I worked on was a PDF format. Um, but these days, people are putting their style guides and brand guidelines online. So, for example, you have drop boxes, uh, design guidelines, and the great thing about putting these online is then you can have downloadable resources that people can use as well. So those are brand guidelines, pretty typical logo, color, type, layout, and so on. Um, there's also the concept of a design language. Um, it's a little bit of a step up from uh, brand guidelines. And usually this is more of like a philosophy or like a design direction that you're going in. So probably one of the most well-known ones right now is material design. Material design is by Google, and the idea around material design is that their um, textures, their animations, everything gives a feeling of a tactile um, feel, like you're dealing with materials. An extension from that is voice and tone. Um, voice and tone is more usually like in a written format, but it's an extension of your brand. Like, what do you feel like? What do you sound like? Um, MailChimp is probably one of the most well-known examples of these. In fact, they have voiceandtone.com. And uh, the idea being the way your tone comes across in your UI. Like, if there's an error, do you probably don't want to be super chipper about the error that the user is getting. But if there's like a success message, then you'd be like, yay, awesome, you did the thing. Um, so that's voice and tone. And then, of course, pattern libraries, or UI libraries, or component libraries, or front-end style guides, whatever you want to call it. Um, these are like super, super common right now. Everybody's putting their pattern libraries online. Uh, these are basically the collection of the bits and pieces of your user interface. Um, probably one of my most favorite uh, examples that are online right now is the uh, organization in the United States called 18F. Uh, they're tasked with creating design guidelines and front-end resources for government sites across the US. And the reason that they're doing this is, if you look at government sites across the US, they're all over the place. Some of them are great looking, some of them are terrible looking, and you don't know if you can trust it. So their whole goal is providing the components and resources for all these different government websites across the US um, in a very standardized way However, all these different organizations can extend upon it and uh, basically extend their own brand across these guidelines. So which one of these are design systems? Uh, well, truthfully, it can be any of what I mentioned. It could be all of what I mentioned, and it could even be a little bit more than what I just mentioned. It's really up to what your organization is looking for and needing out of a design system. Uh, one of the important things, though, that I want to um, uh, bring up is that it's not a side project. A lot of people treat their design system as a side project. They get to it later whenever they get time. Um, they kind of see it as like, oh, like, you know, we'll add to it later once we get 
um, a little bit of free time, but it's not a side project. It shouldn't be a side project. It really should be a part of your regular uh, design and development workflow. It's, and if you're shipping product, like you know, digital products, it should be how you ship product. Uh, there's this really great podcast that Jared Spool does for uh, user interface engineering. It's his own uh, company. And he was interviewing Nathan Curtis. And Nathan Curtis is probably one of the most well-known uh, design systems consultants and advocates in our industry right now. And in this uh, podcast, he's asking Nathan, you know, we've got style guides, now it's design systems. Is this really just a change in marketing, or are these actually different from one another? And in a follow-up tweet after that podcast interview, um, I really liked the way Nathan put it. And this is kind of more of how we think about design systems today. And it's that you know, a style guide is an artifact of your design process. However, a design system is a living, funded product with a roadmap, a backlog, and it's serving an ecosystem. Um, this is pretty much how like, we uh, think about and work with design systems um, and you know, digital product design. It's a product serving your main product. Um, and the whole idea for a design system is improving designer, developer, ed, uh, communication. Um, communication is really key. Diana Mounter is the design systems lead at GitHub, and uh, she writes a lot about um, basically empowering designers to be comfortable to code, um, and maybe not back-end code, but like HTML and CSS, empowering them to code. And she said that true collaboration isn't throwing designs over the wall. This is kind of like the old school way uh, web design used to be done. The designer would work on it, and then they'd throw it over the wall, and then the developer would uh, work on it. Uh, she was saying it's designers, engineers, and the rest of the team sharing the responsibility to build a quality product. Um, so if you're in an enterprise space, which um, I personally am, uh, you can learn that product design within an enterprise organization can be really tricky. Um, it is, as you know, Nathan mentioned, you know, you're serving an ecosystem. Uh, to design for today's modern world of products, it is to design for an ecosystem. And part of designing for an ecosystem is communication. Great team communication is so critical. Um, personally, within uh, my own uh, previous past, I recall conversations happening where you would ask, you know, where can I find the icons? Uh, what color is the border? Where can I find the icons? Like just the same <laughs> questions over and over again. And you know, having these same conversations over and over again create inefficiencies. So one common method that uh, people have used within organizations is what's known as a red line. Um, does everyone know what a red line is? One person knows what a red line, two people, three people, okay, cool. <laughs> well, for those that don't, um, the red line is basically a specification. And it usually might look something like this, where you're specking out the spacing, the type, the font sizes. This was one I actually did many years ago for an Android application. Um, and, uh, you know, it can be pretty tedious. And uh, you can think of it as like a blueprint for your UI. And when you're working on an enterprise scale, it's not very fun. Because <laughs> like designing red line specifications in my opinion, is a very outdated uh, workflow. Um, you're basically thinking about pages when you're doing these red line specs. And it, in, in today's world of product design, it's not about designing pages. Rather, it should be about designing systems. And that's what we're uh, talking about now. Um, so let's say you've decided to embark on creating a design system. You didn't start from this from the beginning, but now you want to retroactively go and uh, apply this into your organization. Well, obviously, you have to figure out your team. Who's going to work on this? Uh, Nathan Curtis, who I mentioned earlier, wrote um, an article called Team Models for Scaling a Design System. And in his article, he goes over three different types of design systems that, or design systems team models that he's observed. 
And the first one being solitary. Usually you get like one or two people, they create their own team, they start working on uh, a design system, but it's really more about what they want to put in that design system and then they distribute it and you can either use it or don't use it, it's all up to you. Um, and it doesn't really scale. It's kind of, if you can think of this as sort of like the overlords. The second model is a centralized team. And this team is more like in service of the organization. So they full time work on this design system. They maintain it, they craft it, they decide on it together. And then it's all like um, uh, in, or, uh, in service of the organization. Like they make what you need. And then the third model that he's observed is called federated. And this is where um, you get people from multiple teams. Like let's say you're in a company that has multiple products or multiple features and you appoint one or two people across all these different teams and they all work together and decide on the design system together. Um, so that's the federated model. Um, at, towards the end of his Medium post, he did ask, um, you know, very curious how other organizations are doing it. Um, so I wrote a follow-up post um, in response because Medium is really good about having like response articles. Um, so I wrote how we do things at Salesforce. Um, and really I wasn't introducing a brand new model. Um, all I was doing was taking a second and his third model and combining it because that's how we do things uh, where I work. So what I called it was a cyclical team model. And this is where we have a centralized design systems team, which is what I'm on. We also have our federated contributors because we have so many products. You know, I, I, if you have heard of Salesforce in the news, you probably see it's like acquisition after acquisition after acquisition. We have a lot of products and a lot of features. So we get federated contributors across all these different areas. Um, while we're the ones um, acting as the librarian or uh, facilitator and maintaining this design system, those federated contributors know their feature areas really, really well. And they're out doing their own research and they know their customer needs uh, better than we do. And so they um, are contributing back. So our design system is informing their product design, but then their product design is in turn informing our design system. So it's a very cyclical pairing model. Um, if you're in a really small organization, you might not be able to build out entire team structures like this. Um, so what might work for you is more of that federated model, getting people from your design and engineering and research um, teams to collaborate and work together on this design system. If you're on a much larger scale like I am, then simply, something more like a cyclical team model might work better. <coughs> As I mentioned, a design system is a product. And so with products, you have to do your research. Uh, so you definitely wanna talk to people. Talk to the people that are going to be using it, pe people that are building it, your stakeholders, and so on. Um, if you want to kind of dig into a research workflow, in fact, we did this uh, in the workshop a couple days ago. Um, it's all written out on this blog post by Adobe. They um, wrote up a, a talk that Isaac Hayes and Donna Chan from AppDirect gave, um, and this is their approach, and it's basically uh, you talk to your users, you develop your, um, or you, you do your interviews, you understand what's needed, develop your principles, your, your stories, and so on, and move from there. So after you've talked to your users, it's important to have a vision. You have to align everyone on the same efforts. Um, you want people aligned. Um, my uh, former mentor, who used to be the chief design architect um, where I work at Salesforce, he said that the more decisions you put off uh, and the longer you delay them, the more expensive they become. So it's really important to come to your decisions as quickly as possible and move forward. Uh, you have to bring your designers, engineers, product managers, copywriters, researchers, like everybody that's involved, align them around a single goal. Um, I just saw this really uh, funny X, uh, XKCD uh, comic and I thought it was pretty funny where the situation, we have 14 competing standards. All right, let's create one universal standard to align them all. 
situation. There's 15 competing standards. Like this happens quite a lot. And the reason this type of thing happens is you're not aligning everyone around a single vision or a single goal. And to do that, it's important to have design principles. Uh, these design principles are, um, you can derive these design principles from those user interviews that you've done. Uh, words might come up a lot around like efficiency or uh, maintainability. Like these, as these words come up a lot, you can kind of start seeing like, okay, these are where uh, we need to align our design principles. Uh, the ones that we have um, on my team, which I'll share, but you know, you may have your own design principles, and that's totally okay. Um, so our first one is clarity. Uh, this illustration, by the way, these illustrations are San Francisco um, landmarks. Um, our intern at the time designed these, and then we ended up hiring him because he's really good. <laughs> but yeah, our first design principle is clarity. We want to eliminate ambiguity. We want to en uh, enable people to see, understand, and act with confidence. Our second principle is efficiency. Streamline and optimize workflows. Intelligently anticipate needs uh, to help people work better, faster, and smarter. Consistency. Uh, create familiarity and strengthen intuition by applying the same solution to the same problem. And finally, our fourth design principle is beauty. Uh, demonstrate respect for people's time and attention through thoughtful and elegant craftsmanship. Uh, again, you might have totally different design principles based on your own needs, um, but one thing I would recommend is once you've kind of nailed down uh, your core design principles, is to then list them in priority order. Uh, this is something we do a lot, whether it's uh, a t list of tasks, a list of objectives, um, any type of list, we always try to put those lists in a priority order. So. Clarity for us is core to the experience. Uh, we need our users to be able to achieve their goals and understand how to do it. Um, efficiency, uh, obviously we want our uh, users to achieve that task very quickly, um, but it, we thought you know, this could have been our number one goal. Um, but if you put that to the extreme, uh, you might alienate new users. So we wanted to make everything as clear as possible and then, of course, efficient. Um, consist uh, consistency, <laughs> uh, building that intuition. And usually in design systems, people rank consistency number one. Um, but for us personally, like we felt clarity and efficiency were more important uh, than consistency. And of course, beauty. Um, so by doing these stack ranking exercises, you know like sort of an order of operations when it comes to design decisions. You might argue, like, we have to make this uh, label the same as on this other screen because that's consistent. But perhaps that context needs a different label because it'll make it a, a little bit more clear or a little bit more efficient as to what you're doing. So by stack ranking your goals, then you know where to um, make those design decisions. And in most uh, design systems related topics, you hear a lot about design standards. And design standards are definitely important. It's why we're doing this to begin with. But design principles are so much more important than your design standards. So sometimes it's okay to you know, give way to your standards if it aligns better with your design principles. And then you want to evangelize and align your whole org, get everybody on the same page. Uh, so we printed, you know, those beautiful illustrations became posters. And we printed them and put them around our office. Um, and basically try to rally everyone around these principles. Um, and then I wanted to mention something that we do in our organization. A lot of companies have similar methodologies um, to this, but it's uh, a yearly activity that we do to align everyone on the same page. It's what's called the V2 Mom. Um, our CEO, Mark Benioff, wrote about it. The slides will be available later, so you can get the URL later. But the idea being uh, everybody in the organization, no matter at what point of the chain that you're on, if you're an exec or if you're an individual contributor, everyone does this activity where they publish uh, openly to everyone, uh, what are their vision? Uh, what is their vision? Uh, what are the values? Like, so what, what they wanna do, what's important about that vision, uh, the methods, like how they're gonna get that job done. 
any obstacles that might come in the way, and then the measures. Like, how do you know that you've actually succeeded and achieved your vision? Um, so you might do something like this um, yearly in your organization, but when we were embarking on uh, building out our design system, we actually wrote one of these for the design system itself, um, and it helped kind of give us like a list of objectives and goals to hit. So a UI inventory is uh, a really good thing to get like multiple people from design development, um, you know, all the different um, organizations that you might have, get people from all these different teams and do an inventory of what you have now. Um, if you want to read a little bit more on how you might do this internally, um, there's a recent article on a list apart um, and uh, by Charlotte Jackson. She goes into how they do it in their organization. So with us, uh, you know, we did a pretty similar method. We went through all our different screens, we printed things out, we cut them out, and then we started like uh, grouping them by things. Like in this case, we have indicators. These are all things that indicate some sort of status, like you've progressed to something or something saved. Um, you'll also see common patterns that are grouped inside other patterns. So obviously a button, a button's gonna be in all sorts of different components. If you don't wanna do printouts, you could even just start sketching out the different screens that you have and do it that way. Um, if you want to save paper, uh, Brad Frost created a Google Doc uh, where you can just screenshot them and drop them into the Google Doc. Um, so that's another way that you could do it. Uh, the point is you inventory all these different elements and then you standardize on these elements and you consolidate them. And when you're doing this process, it's important to take a lot of notes. Um, you're, a lot of things are going to come up, you're going to see like, um, okay, these are the people that are involved, this is the lead designer, this is the lead dev, um, any open-ended questions, you know, should, should this even stay in the system, should we drop it in favor of another component? Um, you want to take lots of notes, and things are going to come up too that might be considered constraints, um, but I think it's good to embrace them. Things around accessibility, you know, color contrast, keyboard navigation, um, even things like um, like how you would use color. Um, there's this really fantastic metaphor that I love by Cordelia McGee-Tab. She equates to um, um, accessibility to a blueberry muffin. And the idea being uh, you want to bake those blueberries in at the beginning. If you try to cram the blueberries into your baked muffin later, you're going to get a muffin that's going to fall apart. It's not going to be a very good experience. Um, so you want to bake it in from the beginning. And then things around like localization. Um, obviously, text expansion is a more obvious known localization issue, but there's also things around color meaning. Um, in the US, you're going to use red to indicate that your stock is falling. However, in China, red is a positive color. It means fortune. So you're going to use red to indicate that your uh, stock is going up. Um, so it's important to document all these considerations that you see. Uh, Miriam Suzanne, uh, uh, a, she's a really, com or a, a really popular um, contributor in the SAS community, and she wrote that if you don't document something, it doesn't exist. So it's important to document these things, because if you don't, you're, you're not going to go back and you're not going to address it. Uh, document as much as you can. The other thing that you're going to see come about are what is known as special snowflakes. And special snowflakes are usually what we like to call, you know, the things that um, need to be different. And sometimes those things um, can be pushed back on. You can say, do you really need this special snowflake or will this other component that we have serve your needs? And a lot of times the answer is yes. But sometimes uh, the answer is no. Like some re research has been done and it's proven that like this one particular thing needs to be different because it will serve our users in a better way. And that's totally okay. You can document that as well. But sometimes these things don't need to go in the design system. Uh, you can uh, judge that on a case-by-case -case basis. And then from there, you establish a roadmap for your design system, and you create your principle-based uh, user stories. Um, so all of this, the whole goal around all of this is to empower your designers and developers. So now that you've, um, you know, you've done your research, you've started your roadmap, and now you're digging into creating your guidelines, um, you know, 
you want to make sure that your guidelines are meaningful. I think almost every style guide that's out there shows their beautiful color swatches. You've got your primaries, your neutrals, your secondaries, and these are really nice to look at. Um, but how are you using these colors? Why are you using these colors? So in the showing like how you apply these colors through uh, visual messaging or maybe showing uh, hierarchy. Um, and these type of guidelines are really awesome for um, moving forward in your organization and knowing what direction you want to go in. But they're also great for hiring new talent. Um, you know, uh, Katie Basie, who's a new designer on our team, was able to get onboarded super quickly because we had this information documented. Uh, she wrote that she was freed from the daily tedium of worrying about like how many pixels something is or what color something is. Instead, she was thinking about the bigger picture, like flows and interactions. Um, so a lot of what I've been talking about has been a little bit more like web focused, um, but we've got a lot of platforms and devices these days, uh, tablets, phones, now we've got watches, refrigerators, cars, like all sorts of different um, places that your UI might scale to. So, um, you know, in our case, um, you know, how do we uh, achieve consistency across such a massive organization and all these different platforms and devices and products. Um, and, you know, we're gonna be updating our UI to keep it fresh. How do we apply these visual design changes faster? Um, and then in our, in our um, specific use case, we actually have a developer ecosystem as well, kind of like Google and Apple does. So we have people that are building their own apps, but they want to put it inside uh, the ecosystem. And they could be on all sorts of stats. You might have people developing for native. You might have people developing on uh, Rails, on Java, on Node. Like, there's so many different stacks. So for us, it was very important that we kept our design system agnostic. Um, so something that we're um, doing internally, and um, people are starting to do it in other organizations, like I believe Target and Nathan Curtis's own agency is doing this, is what's called design tokens. And design tokens are a way to apply your design decisions with confidence. So you can think of them a lot like variables. If you're familiar with CSS or SAS variables, they're, they're essentially variables. Um, in the early days of what we were doing, we actually created this sketch sheet. And we were visualizing what all these different variables were so that we knew um, how, how to use them and then the developers were using this as a variable. Um, and then this kind of evolved into becoming what we now have as tokens. This is our single source of truth. Uh, Sanka Road, who's our senior director, um, said that design tokens are an abstraction for everything impacting the visual design of an app or a platform. Um, and Nathan Curtis wrote about how he uses them in his own organization on Medium. So if you want to learn a little bit more about them, you can read that later. But basically, CSS preprocessors introduced this idea um, of variables, and the whole idea was achieving efficiency and consistency and maintainability. The whole idea being no hard-coded values. Instead of 16 pixels, something is spacing medium. In fact, um, that's how our designers will refer to these things if they're still producing these um, uh, specifications. Instead of saying 16 pixels, they say spacing medium. And then if we ever you know, have to make any changes, it keeps their design specifications uh, true. Um, some organizations do this, some don't need to, but if you're in a big organization and you have all these different platforms and things that you have to consider, uh, you could build a, a build tool um, that will basically convert those things into all the formats that you need. So in our case, we have a build tool that takes these tokens and converts the SAS for the design team, Lightning for the engineering team, iOS gets JSON, XML for Android, our style guide is generated from this, and even color swatches for a design team is generated from this. But the cool thing, so this is all about consistency, but you get a lot of other cool things that you can explore with this. One thing that we're looking at internally, this is not a release feature by the way, but it's something we're looking at, um, is you know, how can we use design tokens to offer configurable settings for users? Some of our users want to use a very comfortable reading 
um, format, and so lots of spacing. You might recognize this from something like Gmail, with the cozy, comfortable, compact. Um, but then some of our users are working in a situation where they need to see as much content on the screen as possible. Um, so they're gonna want something more compact. Um, using something like design tokens, we can pass through a different set of uh, spacing and sizing. Another thing that we're looking at right now, which is one of the, we have this uh, customer idea exchange where customers can post ideas of what they want. And the, one of the top things that they're asking for is a night mode. And if we were to do this manually, it could, you know, across that big scale that we have, this could be really challenging. But now that we have these design tokens in place, we can look at, you know, how can we uh, reconfigure certain colors um, to be darker, but obviously we wouldn't want to invert everything. Like we wouldn't want our greens to become that fuchsia color that tends to happen when you invert green. So being very strategic about how we apply these different overrides. Um, again, this is not current in the product now, but it's something we're looking at. So, um, you know, design tokens are a really great way to help scale and maintain your design system. So I encourage you to think about that. Um, and you may do a different methodology, but something along those lines. So now that you've got your design system in place, you wanna keep your momentum going. Don't let it fall. I loved the zombie persona thing earlier because I also <laughs> like to talk about zombie style guides. And I see this happen so much where people put their uh, style guides online, they get a lot of traction, it, it gets tweeted and shared but they don't actively maintain that style guide, and so it just slowly dies and rots and eats your brains. <laughs> uh, you don't wanna create a zombie style guide. You have to keep it living. Uh, it must be living, and uh, that's why I mentioned, like, it can't be a side project. It can't be something that you treat as like something you'll get to later. It needs to be a part of your process. It needs to be how, how you ship product. Um, and because a design system is product, you have to support it. A really good product is gonna have good support. Um, and so treating it that way. So for us, we do um, office hours. Uh, we do, um, like with every release, we have these advisory boards, we have design reviews, um, we have a chatter, we have a Slack channel, we have like all sorts of different, you know, we do brown bag sessions, like we treat it like a product and so we support the organization by um, helping out the other designers and the other developers be able to use this. Um, you know, this could take a lot of time, but what you could do if you're a much smaller organization is maybe you're using Slack, just have a whole channel dedicated to this where everyone helps each other out. Like I have a component, I don't know what to name this component and then you can all contribute and help each other out. And the other thing that I want to mention is um, that you, it's important to allow your design system to evolve and grow. Uh, Claudina Sarai said that patterns are not dogma. They can change and adapt. I think a lot of people kind of, they fall in love with their design system and they don't want anything to change. Everything must follow that design system. But to make it a maintainable, living, evolving design system, um, it's important to allow room for change. And you know, I get the question a lot, it was like, well, we're not Salesforce, we're just a small startup. Why would we want to do something like this? And I think there is no product too large um, or too small. There's no company too large or too small. You don't have to do something on the scale that we're doing with the tokens and all that, but just having uh, a design system is a great way to enable you to scale. Um, so there is no, um, there is no like, uh, reason not to uh, in make this part of your workflow. Uh, Brad Frost was uh, writing about responsive design and even though this quote is about responsive design, I think it applies very well to design systems. But he was talking about how companies would say, well, we're not BBC or we're not um, you know, this other you know, large website, why do we need responsive design? And he, his post was called, It Doesn't Matter. And he talks about how uh, just because something is hard doesn't mean it's not worth pursuing. It is our job, after all, to solve problems, and we're in the interface business. Um, so similar to how he's thinking this, 
uh, for responsive design, I think this holds true for design systems. It's, it doesn't matter how big your company is, have a design system, make it part of your process. Um, if you're wanting to dig into more articles, podcasts, there's so much information out there. I could give you a whole list. Um, I just recommend going to styleguides.io, which is uh, maintained by Anna Debenham and Brad Frost, and it's open source, so people are contributing uh, all sorts of stuff here. Um, pretty much anything and everything around brand guidelines, code patterns, podcasts, um, you know, all sorts of content and information is on this site. Um, and if you want to talk and, and share ideas with like-minded people that are into this kind of thing, um, there is a design system Slack. Uh, you can get in uh, with, uh, without waiting to be invited just by going to designsystems.herokuapp.com. There's like over a thousand people in there that like love talking about this stuff and it's actually not too chatty, so uh, it's worth checking out. And if you happen to be in San Francisco at the end of March, um, come to my design systems conference. I'll have details later uh, <laughs> about that. So yeah, and then if you're curious, like uh, you know, you can check out what we're doing at uh, lightningdesignsystem.com, or you can also go to salesforce.com/designsystem. And everything's open source. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>